Hello, morning. Uh, my name is Jaydev Desai from Georgia Tech. I'm actually going to be the chair for this session for the Medical uh, Robotics uh, uh, Paper Award. And I'm joined by my colleague uh, Pietro Valdastri from, uh, from Leeds and uh, Nabil Simon from Vanderbilt. So we three are in the committee for choosing the uh, Best Medical Robotics Paper Award. So the uh, first talk in this session is going to be given by Christopher Sevi on a lightweight and efficient portable soft exosuite for uh, paretic ankle assistance in walking after stroke. Uh, you have 12 minutes for your talk, followed by three minutes for question answers. Okay. And uh, so go ahead. Hi, so uh, like you said, I'm, I'm Chris, and I'm here to talk today about our work developing a lightweight and efficient portable exosuit for ankle assistance after stroke. Now, stroke is a condition that affects 7.2 million people in America alone, and of those, some 80% report problems with locomotion. And it's really characterized by hemiparesis, which is the partial or complete paralysis on one side of the body. Therefore, post-stroke gait is asymmetric, is slow, labor-intensive, and unstable. Sorry. Um, and many people walk fewer than 3,500 steps per day. I mean, I was in a an eight-hour workshop yesterday, but I still managed to hit 15,000. And one particular deficit people have is in forward propulsion. So you can see that if the limb here is behind the body's center of mass, then generating a plantar flexion torque as shown here means you're going to generate a forward-pointing reaction force with the ground. And we take the magnitude of that forward-facing force to be forward propulsion. And here you can see that this individual's paretic or impaired leg can do about 1 18th the forward propulsion that his non-paretic leg can. In addition, um, limited toe clearance can really lead to trip hazards and stumbles. Combined, these mean that the ankle is critically important to post-stroke gait. So to address these, uh, we at Harvard have been working on some new devices called soft exosuits. And these assist the ankle in plantar flexion for propulsion and in uh, flexion for toe clearance. On the body, they look a little bit like this. So sensors on the foot detect gait as the person's walking. And then this rear cable retracts during push-off to assist with plantar flexion. And then when the foot leaves the ground, the rear cable gets out of the way, and the front cable takes over to assist with dorsiflexion. When the foot hits the ground again, the front cable gets out of the way, and the entire process repeats. And we like to think of how these devices fit into the entire landscape of those meant to help with walking post-stroke. Uh, so for example, here on the bottom left are orthotics, which have been developing slowly for around 100 years or so. And moving rightward are some really, really cool new devices that are primarily really high power and rigid and can support the body's entire weight. Though we'll never be able to apply quite as much power as those rigid devices, uh, we're still lightweight while being able to provide active assistance during walking. And to develop these, we first needed to know about the requirements for actuation, sensing, and control. And we had to know these, uh, these for variable gait presentations, so really different ways of walking, and for variable environments, maybe on the treadmill and overground. So we started off with a lab-based off-board device that really showed us a good proof of concept to give us intuition about the requirements. And uh, these lab-based studies showed that we could improve ground clearance and propulsion symmetry, which was a really promising sign. So we took them and we worked to develop an autonomous version. Some of the information we got from this were things like how quickly should the motors we have move? Uh, where should we locate sensors? Uh, how many sensors do we need? Textile design, how do we make one that is comfortable and still effective? So the autonomous suit that we've designed still has that compliant textile construction, and it really has six key components, including an actuator that generates the force and a uh, calf wrap that transfers forces to the body. The whole mass is under four kilograms, and our design philosophy has always been to keep the costly mass as uh, proximal if possible. So about 85% of this mass is on the torso, uh, and it's low power. I mean, it lasts more than two hours on a single charge and consumes less than 30 watts of electrical power when walking. And recall, with the suit, we want to control how the cable applies forces in parallel to the muscles. So on the body, we have load cells that sense cable force, IMUs that detect movement of the foot, 
an encoder on the system that allows us to close a position loop on the cable. And then alongside that suit human system, there are really three key components to exosuit control. We have gate event detection, so telling how a person walks. We have a position trajectory generator, how we apply assistance. And then we have a low-level controller that, that, like I said, is fairly straightforward because we have to have an encoder on the, on the system. Um, and because the first two really require the bulk of our time, I'm going to focus on them today. So first we can talk about the event detection. And we can begin by thinking about the nominal gate cycle, which runs from one heel strike to the next heel strike. And uh, we can look alongside that at the IMU information that's available to us, so things like the foot angle or the foot angular velocity. And in a high-level walker, it, this may be straightforward. You just find where the heel strike is. It looks like a little peak right there, right? But in a low-level walker, uh, there may not even be a heel strike at all. So the heterogeneity inherent to stroke makes it really difficult to detect this nominal gait cycle. And through a lot of testing on stroke participants in our lab, uh, we've actually determined it's easier to detect the toe-off and mid-swing events. These are areas where the foot might have lower inertia, so the underlying musculature can really move it with, with a little bit more control. And then another insight we had was that it's necessary to monitor actually both sides of the body rather than just the one we're assisting. So considering the other leg, we can subdivide the gait cycle into three discrete periods, and these really correspond to when we do and do not want assistance, so that allows us to have really reactive control based on the events we're, we're actually detecting. And once we can detect that gait, we can think about how to generate the assistive trajectory we apply. And uh, again, recall that our goal here is to apply the assistive torque during push-off for plantar flexion and during swing for dorsiflexion. Uh, and because we have this Bowden cable uh, actuation, we're able to let cable out in areas where we do, don't want force, and we, we retract cable in in areas where we do want force. But the actual force we observe depends on what the human's doing, which is uh, notoriously unpredictable, especially in someone who's had a stroke. Add into that that it's uh, compliant, it's hysteretic, and it's, it's really nonlinear, that makes it difficult to do force control directly. So instead, we, we modified the movement of the cable, things like when it starts pulling, how quickly it pulls, when it stops pulling, in order to control things like when the assistance starts, how quickly the assistance ramps up, and uh, when it, the assistance stops. And in order to make the assistance adaptive, we make observations about force in one stride, and we modify the cable pull in the next. Uh, as an example of that, we can look at how we adapt the cable pull to achieve a desired plantar flexion force here. So if the peak force is a little bit too low in one stride, we can increase how fast we pull the cable in the next stride to achieve our, our desired force. And we repeat this process for a variety of key metrics that we have, like uh, onset timing of actuation, uh, peak force for dorsiflexion, et cetera. And then we verified these suits in the lab with post-stroke participants. So, for example, here we had 11 participants walk overground with the suit both on and with the suit removed entirely. And we recorded the standard gamut of motion capture and ground reaction forces, plus some uh, metrics of controller performance. And this is always with a physical therapist on staff to guard the participant for safety. Um, and we chose individuals with really variable gait presentations. So like I talked before, uh, some people may present with a midfoot strike instead of striking with the heel. Uh, some people may have instability during either the swing phase or the stance phase. And this was always across a really, vari a really variable array of uh, different gait speeds. This was always with the person's own comfortable walking speed. So it ranged anywhere from 0.4 to maybe 1.3 meters per second. And through this testing, we actually saw that the controller can produce really reliable force profiles with, with low variability, all while maintaining near 100% reliability in, in gate detection, and very quick gate detection with under 90 milliseconds delay from the actual event to when we actually detect it, and a, a very low relative error in the peak force. And alongside that, we can look at the biomechanical results, uh, starting off with the individual data from one participant. And, and through these tests, we showed that the autonomous suit walking over ground does indeed increase the toe clearance, as we can see here, measured by the person's ankle angle. So he's able to dorsiflex more during the swing phase to keep his toe off the ground and to avoid trip hazards. And these videos show a little bit what, it's lo what it looks like when a post truck participant walks in the suit. So you can see that in this top video with the suit on, uh, the, the person's toe clearance is, is higher than it is in the bottom video when he's wearing the suit and walking under his own power. 
And we've also shown that we're able to increase forward propulsion on the paretic or the impaired side. As you can see here, it's measured by the peak forward pointing ground reaction force that I talked about a, a little bit earlier. And then of course, uh, when we look at the larger cohort of 11 participants, not only are these results really promising for one individual, they are consistent across many people in both toe clearance, again measured by ankle kinematics, and forward propulsion, um, again measured by the forward facing ground reaction force. So with these, our, our vision moving forward is that exosuits will really fit throughout the entire continuum of care. So by wearing the exosuit in both the clinic, when you're first learning how to recover from the stroke, and in the community as you leave the clinic and move out into the real world, we aim to create a positive feedback cycle that prevents losses in mobility that we currently see over time with people who've had a stroke. Um, and by adapting this technology to new joints, we, we can really hope to encourage exercise that is variable, intense, and repetitive, which is really exactly what's necessary to restore mobility after stroke. So toward those ends, we are first conducting studies in the clinic with, with physical therapists, with other clinicians, to explore dosage requirements and things like how long should the user walk? What's, what's the best training paradigm for a device like that? Should the, should the device be on all the time when the person's walking? Should we uh, go from having the device on to having the suit slack so the person can, can go from having assistance to walking under their own power? And then we're also improving the design and controllers for use in really variable environments and terrain. So you can see this woman here is able to walk over cobblestones. She's able to walk up and down the curb uh, and across the street. All of this the suit needs to be able to take in stride and adapt to as the person walks around. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming to listen to me talk and for all the other authors that, that weren't able to be here. And I'm happy to take any questions. I was wondering what's the big advantage compared to systems where they look at, uh, at FES uh, stimulation for the drop food syndrome? Mm -hmm. So FES is it's a really cool technology. For, for those who don't know, it's an uh, electrical stimulate, stimulation that triggers your muscle directly. So you apply this little electrode on top of a muscle or on a nerve, and by firing a signal in there, it can cause the muscle to contract. And um, it's really cool and really useful. A lot of our participants actually come in wearing FES systems. But one of the problems is because you're relying on the underlying musculature, it can become fatiguing. Right? So you can walk for maybe 10 minutes in it, and then your muscle becomes tired, just like it normally would if you were walking. And because it's not your brain controlling how the muscle is contracting, it's, it's something external, it can happen a lot more quickly. Uh, also, there's a real, real problem with having to tune them. So a lot of people have to go back in every two weeks or so to get an FES system retuned or, or replaced back on either their nerve or on the muscle, which can really be problematic. Uh, so I, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for this to work in conjunction with something like FES, um, but it's, it's in probably very a different sort of technology. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, can you, can you uh, speak the question? Right. Uh, thank you for, thank you for a nice talk. I'm also developing the angle foot exoskeleton, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, uh, to my knowledge, the, it, do you have any the, uh, target uh, processes that level of the uh, paralyzed patient? Because the, uh, in the hospital, uh, the ankle foot, exos, uh, ankle foot orthosis is used for the, that kind of walking pattern. But uh, in your exosuits, uh, probably the ankle itself has a free of the movement of the abduction, abduction, and the flexion, extraction is usually the ab abduction, abduction movement is usually constrained for that uh, pretty much the, the walking uh, training. 
Uh huh. That. Yeah. So we can um, we, we can look at I guess again at, the, at this diagram here. And um, you're right. I mean, one of the problems with a lot of exoskeletons is something that a lot of people spend time on is figuring out how exactly to align that joint with the biological joint, right? And how which which degrees of freedom should you constrain? Which ones should you let? actuate and which ones should you let the person move passively. Um, and, and our solution to that was really to get rid of the, the exosuit joint altogether. So you can see the, the way we transfer forces to the ground is with this insole here that has um, a couple little loops there that connect to the Bowden cable. So when that Bowden cable retracts, that's what generates the force and it really happens in whatever plane we've, we've aligned the cable in. So that, that does have the advantage of being able to allow the person, or being able to align with the joint sort of naturally, but then it also has the disadvantage of whoever puts the suit on, be it the person themselves or right now a PT or one of us, us researchers, really has to be able to align it very, the cable very well with basically the sagittal plane or maybe you know, a little bit out of plane if we observe that they need some inversion, eversion assistance or something like that. Yeah, but uh, compression force is directly applied to the human bone, is that correct? Correct, yes, through this, so uh, through this soft cap. Isn't it a problem in the, some patient having, because uh, usually the patient has some uh, constraint by the ankle foot orthosis mechanically, so the bone not abnormally moving. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, a bit caring about how that compression force affects the uh, human joint itself. Mm -hmm. So are, are you talking about you know, additional reaction forces on the joint or compression with the soft tissue underneath the, the piece that transfers load to the body? The later one. The, b mm. Because uh, your uh, force is directly, not only the torque, but the compression force is applied to that joint. Okay, yeah, I see. So the compression force, yeah, it all does come right here onto the calf wrap. Yeah. There, Not and that's something done. we spent a long time making comfortable. So like I said, we, we did a, a really, really long time of experiments with this off-board lab-based system, trying out just different calf wrap designs, trying out different textile components, different materials, uh, different you know, straps, and, and basically everything we could to figure out how to transfer that load effectively while still being stiff enough to actually generate the torque we need to. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll stop with that. Thank you again.